Um, even, even Thea, I notice, has abandoned her exquisite range of blouses for a T-shirt, so that makes me feel a lot better, a lot less shabby than I otherwise did. Um, okay, Rick's going to go on first this morning. He's going to be talking ecological ethics. I spent some time this morning preparing for this session by using various schemes to calculate my carbon footprint. And I can tell you that it ranges, depending on which scheme you use, between just over four tonnes and just over nine tonnes. But even on the worst calculation, I'm better than the average, more sustainable than the average North American. I just thought I'd let you know that. <laughs> okay, um, over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm not here to guilt trip uh, anybody. <laughs> oh, go on. Okay. Um, this, uh, is this, is this too loud, booming, is this perfect? How is this for everybody? Okay. Uh, this really is an experimental, critical moment uh, because I'm, I'm trying new things out, both for myself and for the field I work in and, as I understand, for the humanities as well, um, trying to install a, uh, an ethical, an eco-ethical awareness into what we do um, as a discipline and how we think about media technologies and how we rethink um, everything from uh, media history to um, new media, their applications and their uses uh, in various dimensions of, of our life politically and culturally and so on. Uh, this is a part of a part of a book project that um, Toby Miller and I have um, been involved in. Co Toby and I have collaborated before and I want to say something about collaboration which came up yesterday when Lisa and Steve Clausen were talking about complementary work and you know could you help me out and would you like to write the rest of the book for me. It's becoming clear to me uh, as, we, as I do these projects with, with Toby that um, the, the complexity of some of the issues that we're dealing with really requires collaboration. There's just no way that um, you can combine textual analysis, cultural studies, political economy, a anthropology, uh, and now these new dimensions of research that we're introducing without some sort of collaboration or a heavy-duty um, effort of translation from other fields, which is very hard in some cases. And, um, I, don't want, I really want to promote that as a way to, to, to experiment, to, to do experimental critical theory, to, to reach out across disciplines and really think outside the boundaries of, of the discipline, which, have been, which is very hard for people. You, know, you, want, to, you want to refer to those, those texts that you're familiar with. They're the anchors that allow you to understand um, the material that you're actually researching. But oftentimes it's best to kind of you know, go beyond those boundaries and, and meet with others. Um, you know, miscegenate theoretically, wildly, you know, don't stay in your tribe, try new things. And I think that's one of the, one of the um, lessons that I've gotten out of working with, um, with Toby and with others. Almost every project is collaborative anyway, once you have a, uh, an editor and a press working with you, but this is different. I'm talking about the foundational work of rethinking. Play it if you want. <laughs> now this book project began um, as something that we were calling Step Away from the Croissant, which, you know, <laughs> Who Moved My Cheese was already stolen as a title, so, you know, but, and we were both thinking about buttery products that we weren't supposed to be eating as you reach a certain age in your life, but also the hierarchy of, the hierarchy in, in production um, situations in, in the film industry where we had, had imagined the, the lowly intern being instructed by the above-the-line talent to step away from that croissant because it's mine. So we were thinking in terms of, of class stratification and in terms of you know, um, just trying to come up with a title that would be marketable and have legs. Uh, as I said, the cheese thing had already been taken. So um, we were going to do this book on uh, the field of media studies, to rethink media studies for the 21st century. And you know, I mean, it's a modest title. <laughs> you, know, you get to a certain point, though, in your career and somebody says, hey, why don't you two rethink media studies for the 21st century? And, and uh, so we said, yeah, sure, why not? And, uh, uh, we began to talk about this, and, 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 and both of us had been working on, on you know, related issues but together and, and separately, um, and began to write about, you know, there was a chapter on technology. And, uh, and I had actually published something in Spanish, the first thing I had done, ruminating on, a, on this internal dissonance that I thought was a problem with technology as was taken up, and Toby had done uh, work as well on, on technology and some issues of environment. We were kind of coming closer and closer to this problem. And when I began to look into this issue um, and talk about it, I realized that you, know, you couldn't just go to the media studies section of the library and pull off you know, the book that said 
you know, the environmental impact of, of technology and of media technology. Media technologies um, were dealt with in terms of great, you know, great thinkers, inventors, the, you know, the, the, the luck and pluck of certain um, scientists and, and, and technologists, et cetera. But there had been no research on the, on the environmental impact. In fact, when you Google you know, media and environment, you get uh, something about you know, the, the ambient technology in the room creating an environment for you. You're surrounded by the technologies. It's not about the relationship between uh, the environment, material environment per se. It's more about what's surrounding you. Or media and ecology, you'd get media ecology which, if you've read Marshall McLuhan or Neil Postman, you might have an idea about what it is, but only they know what it is, the media ecologists, and it has nothing to do with the ecology. In fact, their metaphor had been separated from the earth completely, and so that wasn't helpful either. Um, and little by little, uh, it, you know, we don it dawned upon us that it hadn't been done yet, which was very frustrating. You know, you, when you want to go write in a synthetic work, you want there to be a huge bibliography already out there, and then you're just going to brilliantly synthesize the whole thing and narrow it down to, you know, little tidbits of, of brilliance. But <laughs> we couldn't do that. It wasn't there. Um, and so this became bigger and bigger and bigger. It became more than a chapter. And, and the book changed from rethinking, you know, all of the different areas of, of the field of media studies, um, film studies, and, and to a book about the technology and the environmental impact of the technology. It, it became something very impressive and very urgent uh, as we got deeper and deeper into it. Um, <laughs> that, I'm trying to explain the project because I want to I make it very clear that it is experimental. It is new. It's not like I'm bringing years and decades of, of experience to this issue. I would love to have I'd love to be challenged you know, from the top to the bottom of what I'm about to say today, and I want people to you know, think about maybe there's a connection I missed or there's a, there's a book I missed, and let me know because I'm going you know, to write it down, I'm going to take it home with me, and it's going to become part of the book. And you too can be acknowledged in this book. <laughs> yeah. Okay, now, um, if you've read the material I gave you, you, you know that I'm... I'm the material is about the uh, ecological ethics of media technology, and there's some introductory material having to do with ecoethics in general. And um, the Patrick Curry book, this book, Ecological Ethics, um, is a great introduction. And I uh, provided a chapter on overpopulation and the challenge to ecocentrism as a, as a just to pose that challenge, because I think it's a good thought experiment, a way to think through other problems. But what I want to try to do today is to go through uh, step by step and, pr and to share some of the other work that uh, is coming out of this project. Now, the ecological crisis um, is not an issue to debate from my point of view. If uh, I read the science correctly, if I understand the, the scientific work, the only country where the elite opinion is still debating whether there's global warming is this one. Just about every other industrialized country, every other scientific community, every other place on this planet, there's widespread acceptance that, that it's either going to be too late if we don't get started on this thing right now, um, or it's already too late and we're screwed. Um, that's the science. And that's why I, I don't like to begin by saying it's an issue. It's not something that I think, I mean, we can talk about the science, but I don't think it's an issue that there's a, been a decline in biodiversity, that the effects on the habitat are clearly destructive to the planet that there's one species that's, in, that's to blame for this, um, you know, the, the, this great extinction taking place, and it's the one species that has great responsibility to do something about it, uh, and it's, it's us, and that the global warming is real, that the components of global warming keep changing. It changed today. I don't know if anybody's read the news about LCD screens, but there's a component there that's not part of the Kyoto pro Protocol that apparently is, is contributing even more ferociously to global warming in, through the LCD production. So anybody who has a beautiful, big, uh, you know, liquid crystal display screen, or even a small one on your computer, has to deal with all of these discoveries. As I said, this is an experimental, critical moment, and we need to be thinking on our feet to deal with this. Um, so it's changing, but it's real. It's um, out there. It's hammering away at, at the disciplines. Some disciplines are taking this up um, very seriously. And again, this is very funny. The creative industries. Um, the discussion about creative industries is generating out of Australia, mostly, in, in the UK, but Australia even more than the UK, 
But the discussion about installing an ecological awareness and ecological research in the humanities is also coming out of Australia. Uh, you know, the primary research on this, as far as I can see, is coming out of some humanistic, uh, humanists who are, who are writing ecology into their work. So uh, I don't know, maybe we, we've got to think about what Australia is up to and take a look uh, harder at uh, what's going on down there. But it is happening. It is happening across the disciplines, and there's more demand that we think interdisciplinarily um, and talk to scientists and reach out across the humanities to the sciences and social scientists on this issue. Now, it's too big for us to deal with this as you know, humanists or as media studies people or cultural studies people. But what I've tried to do, what we've tried to do in this book is to narrow down the role of the media, the role of media technologies in this ecological crisis. And you know, compared to some other industries, it's not so bad. And the good news is that you know, communication technology is the, the basis for creating networks of, of green-minded citizens, of green citizenship, that there's a basis there in the technology itself to try to, that will help us you know, address these issues of the ecological crisis. So media technologies are not all bad. I don't want to make you feel guilty about this. Um, we need them to help us connect with one another. We need them to create these networks and communities of, of people who are interested in, in addressing this issue. We need them for activism, for green activism. Um, as uh, Manuel Castells points out in, in, in one of the volumes of his massive work in the Network Society, um, it's crucial, it's been a crucial component linking up the environmental movement, the worldwide environmental movement. He didn't talk, he didn't touch upon, ironically, the, the problems, the ecological or environmental impact of these technologies, but then again, I, you can't hold it against them. This has not been done. The awareness was not there. The consciousness had not been circulating about this, um, and it's just not coming up. Um, it's very important to think about the positives, okay? And it's very important to think that you know we can we can use these technologies to to link these communities and to create a kind of assemblage of constituencies that are working from ecocentric to anthropocentric to animal liberation, and there are ways to use these technologies to illustrate with film, to illustrate with popular television texts as well. Um, raising awareness and, and creating a much more kind of effective connection to these issues in the, in the environment. So, the good, the bad. The bad, and, and I think, uh, uh, Kirsten, someone asked a question yesterday about that disconnect that we have between the, um, the questionable uh, ecological connections of media technologies to, uh, to you know, uh, media technologies connection to the environment and why we don't, aren't aware so much about this. The bad. Media technologies have been portrayed as a solution. The technological fix is very strong in the literature um, on, on pollution, on environmental impacts. The, the, um, the sense that these are clean technologies is promoted through the marketing and advertising, but also the sense that, that, that you, know, you get these wonderful designs and the, the, they're not smoking. There's nothing coming out of them that seems to be as, uh, as noxious as a car or exhaust or something like that. We, we have a kind of present um, in front of us. We have this presence of, that is not dirty. It's just not dirty. And it's also been promoted as the great new um, you know, answer to the, po to the, to the post-industrial um, society. Um, Rust, Belt, Rust Belt cities um, are going to be built on cultural industries, creative industries. They're going to be built in film, music, radio, TV, graphic arts, etc. It's the solution to the industrial era. It's the solution to the smokestack era. It's the great new beginning of a post-smokestack era. Green smokestacks, as we said. Um, and this is, this is uh, something that we think you know, really um, falsely portrays this as a post-industrial technology. It's not. And uh, you know, tr by linking up, just visually linking up these um, connections between production and, and disposal of these technologies, we tried to introduce this idea that we are not in a post-industrial era. This is the struggle right now for us is to really make these technologies green, to really push these technologies to become post-industrial through efforts, as Toby mentioned yesterday, of demanding that the enterprise uh, purchasing that's done on these major campuses you know, address these issues of green technologies, to use the pressure of major um, orders and purchasing and service contracts to make sure that they're green. We can do that here you know, in, in the university setting, but also we can do it as activists, and activism is growing around these issues. So this is the kind of beginning of the eco-crisis, the ecological crisis, the role of media in that. Uh, it's surprising to hear that um, ICT globally, information and communication technologies globally, are drawing enough energy to emit 
um, you know, carbon emissions that are on a par with the aviation industry. It's kind of shocking to hear that because it wakes you up to the idea that, well, you know, these things are plugged into the wall. The wall's plugged into a grid. The grid's going somewhere that all those dirty smokestack industries are going. These wonderful clean technologies. So it's hard to connect with that because the, the, you know, the, the, the kind of sublime or the kind of awe-inspiring um, nature of these technologies. We just love them. Our gadgets are wonderful. Um, you know, you can do your, your carbon footprint by counting how many gadgets you have. Anybody here has more than one cell phone, maybe ought to rethink that. Um, but I'm not, not here to guilt trip anybody. I guess I'll be coming back to that theme over and over again. Okay, so the ecological crisis is not an issue to debate. From my point of view, it's really real. It's hammering at us with, you know, a, a terribly powerful empirical hammer, and we've just <laughs> got to respond to it. Media studies, media studies hasn't taken this up. Maybe it's an issue that should be in all disciplines to take up the tools that they use. Creative industries obviously needs to take this up. Um, hopefully John Hartley might mention this next week in his discussion. I'm not sure. We, I did discuss it with him, and he, he does see it as an important aspect of how the creative industries could become more eco-efficient, which again is part of that managerial um, language, but still, that's something. It's a step in the right direction. We should be hopeful. I'm, just, I'm going to try to frame this in a way so that when, when I get to the despairing bits, you won't you know, be too upset. But we should be hopeful because we're talking about it. It is new. The movements to uh, link labor and um, the environmental movements, I said, um, recent, uh, recently taking place in the mid-90s, starting in the mid-90s more or less, getting the media reform people to take up these issues will be a, um, something that I'll be involved with. Um, and once we can do that, then perhaps some of these um, some of these questions of ownership, control, and, and, and access to media will have a kind of different way to um, approach the policymakers in Washington. It's a big issue, and I, um, as I said, holding out hope that we can do this, and I have kind of faith and deep, deep-seated commitment to make this happen. Bob McChesney, man who um, is a media historian, took up the cause of uh, ownership uh, and control of the media as a major issue, um, diminishing uh, the, um, the potential role that media have to keep democracy healthy and happy, the growing, uh, narrowing, let's say, of the number of companies in, in charge of the uh, widening number of channels of, of television, um, radio, and, uh, and newspapers. Um, in the early, well, I guess it's five years ago now, um, it began a major effort to try to link uh, academics, but also activists around the country, developed a, a nonprofit. Or, that's not me, is it? Oh. <laughs> All right, who's messing around with it? I don't think it's me. Hold on, let me turn it off. Hello? Hello? Uh, the media reform movement took up these issues of ownership. Um, I, primarily ownership, minority ownership became a, more of an issue more recently. But the idea was that uh, the FCC had, uh, had fallen asleep at the wheel and allowed these companies to take over more of the media that we used to to debate public, burning public issues, and, and they were shaping the agenda. And you know, you know the sort of general debate about, about this. But there was on-the-ground activism, and it grew to, um, to involve thousands and thousands of citizens, not just you know, the hundred or so academics that actually think about policy and, and changing media through policy reform. Um, and there have, been, there have been now four or five um, conferences uh, inviting citizens from around the country to come and, and uh, you know, participate in this, in this uh, area. And the surprising thing to academic when you go to these conferences is that you, know, you really are a minority there. They're not people talking about theory. They're not quoting you know, Habermas or public sphere stuff. These guys are talking about, I'm living in a small town outside of Baton Rouge, and there's this one radio station there that I can't get any local news from because they were taken over by this place called Clear Channel. And I don't know what the heck I'm, tr you know, I'm trying to figure out where the traffic's going to be like, and I'm hearing some music that, you know, and it was that simple. And they were concerned that their local community was being affected by this. 
This is an issue which is, you know, ongoing and, and, and has been a very important way of organizing people in this country around issues of media control. It's an issue, I think, it's an area, I think, where we can actually green some of these questions and um, uh, one where both the, the, out, the outlets for understanding um, green practices or environmental movements <laughs> and the agenda being set by the likes of Fox. Again, um, Fox News is one of these places where you hear all the, you know, the junk science on global warming, despite the fact that Rupert Murdoch is one of the leading uh, corporate heads in the greening of, of uh, News Corp. I mean, we can talk about that, but, but um, it's happening, and on the ground um, there are citizens who are really concerned about this, who are trying to make these things happen and bring, bring green issues into the media reform movement. Little by little, it's going to happen. Uh, but, as I said, you know, it's just a recent phenomenon that you get these uh, labor people and the, and the environmental people talking to one another. So I'm hopeful that it's going to continue to, to um, to become greener. So what I want to do today is, is, to, um, is to introduce some of the issues of working in, um, from an ecological perspective on the history of media technologies. Obviously, the, the ecological crisis didn't begin yesterday. It didn't begin because, you know, I read about it. It didn't, you know, it's been ongoing and, you know, scientists and, and environmental scientists have been talking about this for a while. Um, the role of media in this did not begin yesterday either. Um, and it's been ongoing and has been ongoing since uh, the industrialization of, of media making practices in the 19th century. So what I want to do today is just to give you some little snippets of, from the past and to talk about the problem of, of looking back at media technologies from an ecological perspective. As I said before, when, when we look at this material, we had to connect the dots ourselves. There were, there were no historians out there who would say, you know, Gutenberg, you know, print, chimp, the print shop that Gutenberg worked in had chemicals. They had heavy metals. They had ink dust. They had um, linseed oil. They had turpentine. And all of these are chemicals that were, you know, the workers there were being exposed to. Nobody's talked about that. The Gutenberg Press was, you know, it caused this, uh, this, this information revolution to help underpin the, the expansion of European, um, European dominance in the, in the, in, from the 14th to the 18th and 19th centuries. It, you know, the printing press was essential to the social revolution, but nobody's talking about the environmental impact. Um, so, you know, this is, this is one of those things where you just have to say, oh, shoot, it's up to me. I've got to have to pick and choose these, uh, these elements to write this story. So I'm going to try to read a little bit and, um, and try to talk through this because, you know, when I looked at this chapter, I realized I wrote too many words, that, that, you know, so I've edited it down. So I'm going to just try to give you a, a little bit of a preview of how this sounds. So from an ecological point of view, the chemical and mechanical processes vital to post-industrial media technology have yet to shed the toxic roots of their 19th century origins. And as I said, this runs counter to the way that high technology, service, and cultural uh, sectors of today's new economy, or creative economy if you want, supposedly represent clean business, a post-manufacturing utopia for workers, for consumers, for residents, where the byproducts are code or intellectual property and not smoke. We think this falsely portrays the ecological crisis as a disastrous legacy of an extinct means of production rather than what it really is, uh, the everlasting industrialism that continues to define our times. Um, now, to do an ecological history, it means you have to find source materials that are, that are always linking the, you know, the intimate relationship between the environmental histories and the technology histories. So if you're going to go out there, if you're going to follow in my footsteps here and go out there, you're going to have to try to find those source materials that make this happen. Um, there are some historiographical matters that we have to think about as well. A major challenge for the media historian uh, is reading the historical record and understanding that ecological perception in history will not be expressed by the actors themselves in terms familiar to ecologists of today. So, you know, I mean, if you do find testimonials of Gutenberg's, you know, workers in the, in the print shop, they're probably not going to be talking about, you know, um, their, their lung disease that they got from inhaling too much ink dust. Probably there wasn't that kind of awareness. Or, you know, what, what's the you know, problem with my weak bones, you know, from the lead that I've been exposed to? I'm not sure that you're going to find that in the historical record. Number one problem, translating and putting together these fractured histories in, in a way that makes sense in the present to the ecological 
to the environmentalist and ecological uh, ecologist. Um, the, her the Earth as well, you know, geological history is very curious, but it's hard to kind of connect that up with, with media history. But the Earth holds further clues, um, but the ecological evidence and technological causes are obscured by deeply entrenched attitudes that inhibit the analysis of historical sources of industrial hazards, for example. Um, there were no inventories of toxic waste prior to the 1950s, and this creates a perception that there was no toxic problem prior to the 1950s. And so, again, the record is there, but when does it begin to actually generate um, uh, evidence that's worthwhile for such a history? And writing a historic uh, ecological history of media requires abandoning a powerful mythology about media technology. And this is something I think you might be more familiar with. Uh, as I call this, sort of the, the fog of enchantment in which this history is um, sitting. Behind the carefully constructed dioramas of human genius, craftwork, and techno-scientific inspiration, there are intimate and inescapable ties to ecological change and environmental harms. Gutenberg's printing workshop was not an odorless and tidy place, but one filled with alchemically altered natural elements and process residues of fumes, dust, and heavy metals. The telegraph operator tapping commands and communiques into the singing wires from trading floors, army outposts, and newspaper offices risked exposure to acids used in batteries while the wired network demanded its part of the earth for mining and smelting industries. The sailors and engineers who laid the undersea cable may have braved treacherous seas to link continents and make communication and commerce faster, imperious and truly global, but their wires were also brought at the expense of miners' lives and old-growth forests supplying the insulating latex. The printing press, the telegraph, the phonograph, the photograph, cinema, telephone, wireless radio, television, and the internet, all, all of them have changed the world while none change the earth. That is the central myth that ecological history must contest, that the earth was not changed by any of this, while we have great stories of, of social revolution. Um, print and paper and pulp making set the pattern. The ecological history of print media begins with paper making, which is a technology that had traveled from China to the West via Islamic territories over the course of a thousand years. Paper mills operated in Al-Andalus by the 12th century, and a papermaking industry had emerged across Europe from Bologna in 1293, Basel in 1424, to Krakow in 1491. Two important properties of paper mill technology are very familiar to us uh, already in the, in, in the present day. Um, water pollution and deforestation. I think you can kind of connect those two already. Since at least the 14th century, however, papermaking was involved, uh, has involved the location and provision of enormous quantities of clear water, both as an energy force to run the mill and, and also to, um, for um, the uh, production of the paper. But deforestation didn't really begin until the mid-1800s. Um, you know, obviously, we understand that paper's made out of wood now, but it hadn't been made out of wood until late in the later in the 19th century. Prior to that time, it was made out of raw material like rags, cotton, and linen, and there was also parchment or, you know, sheepskin, goatskin. It would take hundreds of sheep, though, to make a, a Bible. And so it wasn't, really, it wasn't really cost effective in the days, and they soon realized that they needed to make paper out of something else. And cotton and linen were the preferred ingredients. Um, we do know that the ink at, in the early days was composed of lamp black, turpentine, and boiled linseed oil. Uh, but we don't have an account of workshop conditions, as I said. Again, if these are questions, question marks over the historical record, providing, I uh, guess, subjects for future research. Um, but, we do, but we do know from the present day record what turpentine, uh, boiled linseed oil, and lamp black can do. Um, you know, they can affect the lungs and mucous membranes, they can affect the nervous system, liver, and kidney, and um, linseed oil at least can be a real irritant to the skin. Um, cleanup would have required uh, additional turpentine. Turpentine was drawn from living pine trees. And in the US, at least through the 19th century, turpentine was provided through, primarily through slave labor in the South. The southern white pines were, were where the turpentine was extracted for uh, the resins that were used in what's called naval stores, you know, the, the, the resins for waterproofing and all that. Turpentine was, was derived from the same kind of chemicals. Um, again, the links between the, the, the chemicals, the effects on the workers, and also where it's coming from and certain uh, political and economic arrangements of the day in, involving, in this case, slave labor. And after the Civil War in the U.S., at least, uh, we relied on forced labor throughout the industry. It didn't get much better, in other words, to get that turpentine. Turpentine, who would think that that would be part of the history we need to understand for, for print uh, technology? 
Movable type uh, in various forms had been used in China, Japan, and Central Asia, and in Europe before uh, this German guy, Henna Gensfleisch, of the House of Gutenberg, uh, you know him as Johannes Gutenberg, uh, invented the method, his method in the 15th century. It required a, a tweaking a little bit of the, the, the alloys that were used to create a soft enough um, uh, metal so that the imprint would uh, be just right. Um, now, these have obviously trace elements of heavy metals uh, that you know we might find in the human diet, but this had been this had introduced it into a new practice for for making media, and that's one of the things I think needs to be you know just a kind of point of reference. What is introduced into the environment when a new technique for making media is is developed? In the early 1800s, steam-powered presses multiplied the potential of printed pages from three to four times, and they added new synthetic elements to the environment with the introduction of coal-burning steam power. New mechanical processes were followed by chemical innovations of chlorine compounds derived from the process for manufacturing sodium carbonate and caustic soda. Again, new vocabulary. Uh, if we're going to talk about the history of media technologies, it's not just about social impact. It's also about um, chemical innovations, chlorine, um, that, uh, that would be used to, um, to take the color out of the rags, to take the patterns out of the rags, to whiten the rags, obviously. And here, again, the link to the past to the labor practices. In the U.S., women workers did most of the rag preparation, you know, the ripping of the, the rags, the removal of buttons, the pulling apart of the seams. And, uh, you know, where do we find in the historical record any kind of stories about their, their con working conditions? Um, uh, well, Herman Melville wrote in The Paradise of Bachelors and the Tartars of Maids a kind of report on what's happening in, in one mill that he visited where he wrote that um, all of this ripping converted the tatters almost into lint. Um, and that in the rag room, the air swam with fine, poisonous particles from which, all, which from all sides darted subtly as motes in sunbeams into the lungs. So we know that it was not a clean environment where the rags were being ripped and, and the dust and the lint was, was being um, issued into the air. We begin to get a picture of the environmental relationship or the ecological um, relationship to the development of these technologies. Between 1899 and 1919, tonnage consumption of processed wood pulp increased 1,175% in the U.S. alone. Advertising expenditure in print media increased 742% in the same period, fueling what one uh, writer called a startling increase in newsprint, book paper, and paperboard consumption. By the 1880s, waste paper was already a household problem. Um, this is from... a um, great book by Susan Strasser called Waste and Want. Uh, and this spread quickly with the surge in demand from the commercial print media and for the substantial amounts of paper for labels and cardboard for packaging in the, in the advertising industry. There is a, a great uh, historical essay that I found where there's a link between um, the, the commercialization of, of print media and the rise in demand for paper and an increase in the demand for wood pulp. Uh, and you can make that link yourself to how it's going to affect the pro problems of deforestation. Um, at the same time, at the end of the 19th century, the rising demand and, and not enough uh, wood pulp to provide uh, to the paper industry, the U.S. market uh, was opened up to the Canadian uh, pulp and paper industry, a part of a, um, a, um, an antitrust investigation of a U.S. paper monopoly. But what this did was it opened up the Canadian forest to the commercial um, political economy in the U.S. drawing now from their forests as well. So again, the link between the processes, the demands linked to the, to the environment and now growing political economy involving um, more and more of the planet. Now with each innovation in the pulping process, it deepened the, um, the connections to the environment in, in a couple of ways. Every innovation allowed you to use more different kinds of tree species, so more of the forest could be, could be um, you know, tapped and also um, complicated the number of compounds in the waste liquor that was emitted into the waterways. Even by 1930, uh, it was w well known that paper making was one of the principal industries polluting water. Um, you know, our books, you know, we, again, will raise this ethical question. We love books. We love these things. Innovations in chemical bleaching of pulp produced a number of new synthetic byproducts, including one that you're familiar with, dioxin, um, which was eventually discovered to be a carcinogen that is known as a bioaccumulative toxin. That is, it settles in the ground, it settles in the water, it decays very slowly, it can travel upstream, so um, it's a very dangerous one. 
Uh, environmental hazards for print workers remain serious despite changes in production techniques over the course of the 20th century. Um, the print shop exposes workers to airborne and liquid toxins today, even today in the 21st century, to solvents, developing solutions, and inks, uh, while emitting into the environment a low-level smog, lo local atmospheric smog, heavy metals and ink solvents and silver, and all of this into the wastewater and into the air. Even today, um, these practices are, are well known, and they're you know, slowly but surely become, getting more attention. By the, by, by, the time we're, by the time today when we're talking about this, uh, I think there's even a citation there. The paper and, pa paper and pulp industry was the single largest consumer of water used in industrial uh, activities in, in the wealth democracies of the OECD the second largest, largest consumer of energy, and the third largest greenhouse emitter. Now, greenhouse gases from paper and pulp are carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matter, sulfate, di sulfur dioxide, and, and other um, volatile organic compounds. But the important point here is that in some cases, they emit more uh, greenhouse gases than electronics and computer manufacturing, and in some categories, it's higher than mining and petroleum industries. Paper and pulp industry, your magazines, your newspapers, your books, um, think about this. Uh, as finally, as printing has become a part of household life, we all have a printer in our office and at home, uh, the implications for pollutions through the plastics, the ink mist, the household ozone clouds. By the way, if you have a printer, don't keep it close to children. Keep it away from you when you put it in your offices. Put it in an in isolated part of the office as well. Uh, and then recycling is also an issue, not to mention the 575 million printer cartridges that are thrown away in, in the U.S. alone each year. Um, this has not gone without resistance, and I have to say there was one attempt in the early 20th century in the U.S. by a, a Republican congressperson to try to tax uh, advertisers for every column inch that they used in, in newspapers and other areas because it was well known that, that they, were, uh, they were contributing to the deforestation at that time the advertising association <laughs> hit back very hard. The legislation was knocked down. And along with the reaction to certain consumer movements that were taking place in the early part of the 20th century, um, this became a real threat to the uh, advertising um, association. And they really redoubled their efforts in, in promoting themselves as a, as a very useful social um, actor and a very a good corporate citizen. And to this day, uh, they still fight the efforts to try to raise attention to this issue. But it's paper and pulp manufacturers are one of the biggest polluters uh, there is. Now, in a historical, you know, when you teach history of media, you usually go from, you know, news, the printing press all the way to the present day with the convergence of technologies and digital media. And that's the best, you know, best and easiest way to do it. But the point about, the point about doing ecological history is it tells you a couple of, you know, it, it tells you to rethink a couple of the major lessons that we've, um, we've assumed were, were, the, were the truth. And one of them is that convergence really began in the 1980s. It's not true. Convergence is probably 100 years older than that. And we can see it already around the chemical and mechanical processes that were being used in the paper and pulp manufacturing industry. They were the same ones that would be used in film, that is, um, film stock manufacturing. Um, some of the same chemicals, some of the same, um, some of the same circulating problems from the factory to the water to the air. All of it was already part of the same kinds of technology. What we talk about when we t think about convergence is digitalization of the media and the efforts of, of uh, some corporations to try to provide voice, data, um, image, sound, all through the same kinds of technologies. The environmental history tells you a different story. There was already a culture of convergence developing in the 19th century. And this culture of convergence was numb to the new occupational hazards created by large-scale transportation and communication projects, to the habitats destroyed, to migratory animal and bird paths obstructed. And you know, one, I guess, familiar example of such hubris was the transcontinental railroads fragmentation or bifurcation of the American bison herd, which uh, enabled the uh, genocide of the Na Native American population. Um, for all the 19th century and most of the 20th, business and government shared an anthropocentric ethico-political orientation to the environment that left little chance for rival claims of conser conservationist native populations or others, except perhaps of settler environmentalism, which is a variant of uh, conservationism that idealized colonial Edens. Non-human nature stood as a mere obstacle to the aims of nation-building and profit-making. 
it would be overcome, domesticated, idealized, and finally exploited as a resource along with labor and the industrial processes that drove the development of modern communication. Capitalist competition and government in action ensured that media technology advanced at the expense of the environment and its inhabitants. By 1930, uh, industrial waste was well known to pose risk to workers and waterways used by nearby populations, in the U.S. at least, and in Europe. But nuisance and riparian laws, uh, laws regulating the use of rivers, uh, were rarely enforced for fear of chasing away industries and jobs. It's a very familiar story. Businesses were increasingly arrogant about dumping waste into rivers and sewage systems. Landfills were not widely used until 1945. We've become familiar with them. But they, they really did not become uh, widely used until uh, after the war. Manufacturers in all sectors shared an attitude about waste that was bolstered by a growing number of business textbooks advocating scientific management that Frederick Taylor had popularized in the early 20th century. Managers and factory designers were uh, presumed that the reduction or elimination of waste would slow production and profit taking. Uh, so they would design uh, waste elimination in a particular way um, simply by moving it out of the way. Uh, that is dumping it on site or into waterways. I mean, it's just put it in, in the rivers or wherever they could, just get it out of the way. It was not a question of how to dispose of proce process residue safely, but one of how least to interfere with the manufacturing process. The convergence of this convergence of chemical and mechanical technology, of this capitalistic competition and lax government enforcement, ensured that photographic, electric, and electronic media would be born as rapacious despoilers of the earth. Um, in other words, the stage had been set. Uh, for an unquestioned kind of um, despoilation of, of the environment. Let's see if I can get a slide up here of, uh, of um, Kodak Park for you. We all love the movies. Um, this is Kodak Park in Rochester. Um, the type and volume of chemical waste emitted into the air and waterways by large-scale raw film production can be traced to the chemical processes for cellulose extraction of cotton and wood pulp invented in the 1800s. I said it's already been developed by paper makers. Um, cellulose nitrate film, it's the same process that, that was used to, uh, to, I mean, the same basic chemical process for, you know, uh, explosives. It was well known to be very combustible, and so there were a number of different things are done to make sure that, that the projectionists would be safe. They'd be well trained and then they'd be put in a fireproof box and show the movie. <laughs> so it was well known and it even became a joke in some early silent films. But the point was that the process involved a number of um, new ecological relationships. The main ingredients for cellulose nitrate film were cotton and silver. Um, Kodak used about five million pounds of cotton annually in 1926 and almost uh, twice that amount in 1936. The silver arrived at Kodak Park in 42-pound bars of bullion. Um, in 1926, Eastman Kodak had become the second largest consumer of pure silver bullion in the U.S. after the United States' government mint. The water that was used in, in Kodak uh, is astounding. By 1926, Eastman Kodak's raw film plant was producing about 200,000 miles of film annually but using um, more than 12 million gallons of water daily from Lake Ontario, which then was spewed into the uh, Genesee River after it was processed. At the end of the 20th century, when they supplied 80% of the world's film stock, Kodak Park was using 35 to 53 million gallons of fresh water a day. And by then, they had become the primary source of pathogens, again, dioxin, released into New York State's environment. I know. Uh, the process for dissolving the silver involved uh, a, a number of toxic elements, including nitric oxide. Again, um, the processing and, and bleaching of the cotton was also uh, involved a number of bleaching agents that would then be emitted into the Genesee River. All, all most of these are carcinogens. It would take a, a week or so to process the, 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 um, the cotton for the, film, for the film base, but and washing it out, they would wash it into the river. By, by the 1970s, they were required to store some of this on site, but they had continued to be one of the biggest polluters in, in New York, if not the U.S. I want to go fast forward here because I want to get to some technologies which are much more familiar to everybody, including the ones that you're holding in your pockets and in front of you. Um, but I'd show you these pictures of Kodak. You can see the silver bars there. It's just stacked up, hoarding. 
By the way, Kodak continues to be one of the major um, uh, buyers of silver on the planet. Well, Kodak and Fuji, I think, together buy a lot of silver. One of the, they're one of the top purchasers of silver. Processing the cotton, the big vats. Now, we're into an area more familiar to us, but electric media. Um, I say electric versus electronic for a reason. Electric, electricity is probably the most, uh, the, the point of convergence for almost all the technologies we're familiar with now. But it was telegraphy that made electricity, um, that made electricity an important uh, commodity for, uh, partly because it was the industry that um, became most, most involved in uh, the development, mass uh, use of, of the technology of electricity. But it wasn't electricity we're familiar with today, it was batteries. Now, again, in the past, we don't usually think about this, what uh, kind of uh, energy sources were used, but batteries were the primary source of all um, electrical power prior to the establishment or the, prior to the development of incandescent lighting and Edison's uh, electrical systems. Um, the word battery, uh, of course, was coined by Frank, Benjamin Franklin when he, and this is a picture of, of Leyden jars, when he was able to kind of shoot jolts of electricity as, as, as if they were f coming from a battery of cannons. Um, so I, I, I found that picture. I thought you might like that. The batteries themselves uh, contained a number of different toxic elements that would have really harmed any uh, telegraph operator using them, inclu including sulfuric acid that would have splashed in their hands and, and caused fissures in their uh, palms of their hands while they were handling this. Again, another issue that has to do with what we, um, what we consider to be a clean technology. No one, ever th no one ever thought that those wires of the telegraph operator would end up connected to a, a battery somehow, but this uh, was a, a, major, a major problem for telegraph workers. Uh, secondary batteries became, se that is storage batteries, became a, a useful uh, source of energy by the end of the 20th century, even as they were developing a, a, the wide grid of the uh, of electricity. Now, one of the problems with um, with lead production and lead batteries is that uh, it became the primary source of poisoning of workers in the in the 20th century, and continues to this day to be the largest sor source of lead poisoning in in in, um, in, in le any lead-based industry. And um, now, with more recycling, a lot of uh, lead workers are, are subject to to the same problems. And it's batteries that become the source of this issue for um, for the workers. The electrical generator had its own problems, uh, having to do with how the transformers contained um, flame retardants that would be used to cool and insulate, and these, uh, these uh, contained PCBs. I don't know if, um, if you're familiar with polychlorinated biphenyls, but they're, they're, you know, they've been outlawed in the U.S. and Europe, and they've been scheduled for a complete removal from the system. But anywhere you drive along the U.S. byways, you can still see the transformers up there, and they contain these poisons uh, still. Now, the wires inside uh, the telecommunication system were eventually going to be made out of copper, and this wouldn't happen until the U.S. became the major copper producer in the world. One of the things that this, uh, one of the um, insights that you gain from understanding copper is just how important it has been to the, to the development of military communications, to the communication system, and how, um, and how rare it's becoming. It's a, it's a strategic um, uh, and precious metal that is becoming more and more scarce on the planet. And it remains its importance to military and uh, military communications and uh, to communications in general far outweighs availability on the planet. So there's great tension there in terms of developing communications technologies, creative industries based on um, these wired technologies, including um, unwired technologies as well. So copper is another area of, of interest. And now, I just want to talk a little bit about the wireless technology that you're all familiar with. It was, it was the invention of, um, of wireless technology that introduced something completely new into the environment with electromagnetic fields. Uh, your telephone has electromagnetic field. Your computer, the wires in the, uh, the ground, the, electri the electrical wires around you have electromagnetic field. Um, it's important to understand that, that this had never been introduced into the environment before. We already have an electromagnetic field circulating the Earth, but this was the first time that we had actually invented something uh, that could produce an electromagnetic field and, and stick it into the environment. Uh, the artificially created EMFs introduced by electronics into the Earth's natural electromagnetic fields created radiation exposure that had no counterpart in man's evolutionary background. 
we understand X-rays are bad. We understand that the ultraviolet rays are bad. What is called non-ionizing radiation, which is the radiation used to transmit wirelessly between these computers and the, and the router in this building, um, are considered to have certain effects that, um, that are well studied but not well publicized. And I want to just uh, bring your attention to those now so that you will hold your phone away from your head from now on after you hear this conversation. Um, the Department of Defense, for obvious reasons, the Department of Defense was really concerned in the 50s with the exposure of, of military personnel to microwave uh, technologies, uh, radar, sonar, microwave technologies. It's a higher frequency, a higher um, exposure to radiation. And so they did a number of studies that showed that there was uh, um, thermal effects, the heating of soft tissues, the heating of hard tissues, bones, the effects on heating of the brain. These things were well known, and they tried to protect the workers. But the Soviets were also conducting um, studies at the same time, and the Soviet minimum standard for exposure was about a thousand times higher than the Americans. And uh, if you use these, if you use these different standards, if you were a Soviet, you'd hold your phone over here. <laughs> if you're American, you hold it here. Uh, I don't want to go into the, um, you know, the min minutia of this, but it's important to, to understand that in the 70s, this was being discussed. In the 2000s, you don't hear much about it except more recently with some long-range studies that are coming out now on cell phone usage. But here's how they described the, what they called chronic exposure syndrome in the Soviet Union. These are the symptoms. Tell me if any of this uh, rings a bell. Headache, eye strain and tearing, fatigue and weakness, vertigo, sleeplessness at night and drowsiness during the day, moodiness, irritability, hypochondria, paranoia, either nervous tension or mental depression and memory impairment, <laughs> sluggishness, inability to make decisions, loss of hair, pain in muscles, and in the heart region, breathlessness, sexual problems. See, like, all the phones are going like this now. <laughs> Trembling eyelids, fingers and tongue, you know, increased perspiration in the extremities, rash, and exposures in the 1 to 10 micro, uh, well, in this close range, changes in the EEG patterns. Now, there are a number of studies based on real live people being exposed to microwaves, and most of them had, the, the research ha did not correlate directly between uh, negative or harmful effects and exposure to microwaves, except in a large-scale study on Polish, um, uh, Polish uh, soldiers, um, where they did find uh, uh, increase in cancer rates. But there was one very funny, well, I think it's, you know, Cold War stuff. When the, when the Soviets had aimed all these microwave transmitters at the U.S. Embassy, and between 1953 and 1976, and they were just like, you know, radiating this building with, uh, with microwave energy, they did um, test all the employees, and the official report says that there was no um, a correlation between microwave exposure and any harmful effects. That's the official story. But, um, I, you know, you just love these cold, sort of Cold War. The U.S., of course, didn't say anything about it because they were probably doing the same thing. But that was a, um, a widely publicized um, point. Electromagnetic frequencies are essential to all microelectronics and to all of the technologies that we use in this business that we're in. It's really crucial to understand that, that it's, you know, it's, the long-term effects are not well known. But I'm the, I'm, my generation's probably the first one that's had constant exposure since birth. Um, and uh, not sure what's going to happen with that, to tell you the truth. But I have felt some of those symptoms. <laughs> um, I could go on to talk about uh, silicon, which seems to be a clean technology. It's not. Uh, there are problems at the extractive end with the miners of, of silica or ferrosilicon. Silicosis, it's called. It can affect the, the lungs and uh, diminish the, the ability to breathe. Um, there are other things uh, involved with x-ray leakage. It was a major case in the 1960s with colored television sets that caused General Electric to recall 90,000 sets, I think, in 67, uh, and provoked a, um, a new law in, in the U.S. to establish radiation protection. Satellites, again, another technology which seemed to be not away, far away from us, but the, there are messy discharges that are involved with rocketry. They use nuclear power. There are other things that are happening with 330 million pieces of, of junk floating around above the planet. A lot of these are the size of a mic, uh, just a speck. And at the, at the velocities that they travel could do uh, great damage both to the, the scientific equipment that's been launched out there or a poor astronaut who happens to be floating around in the space station when one of these little specks comes and punctures the, um, the suit. It's, uh, it's a mess up there. And it's been, it's been made messier by the deregulation of the 80s and the proliferation of, of direct television satellites. Now, all of this is to say it's been going on for a long time. 
we've made a, we've been remiss in paying attention to this. There's a lot of research to do making these connections between environmental history and technological history. Uh, in the present day, we have to deal with what's happening now, but there are layers and layers and layers of problems if we look at the past. And other questions that we might ask have to do with the sites at which you, we find old media companies or old battery um, companies or um, you know, old companies where there might have been some sort of storage on site of these, of these toxins. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that, the, that this is you know, just the beginning. I have not read any other media histories that deal with this. And if, you know, if they have been published in, in other in languages I don't read, please find them and send them to me. I'm desperate to be proven wrong, to be proven um, you know, weak and, and, and terrible at this. I really don't want to be the only one doing this. Uh, we don't want to be the only people doing this. It's been hard. Um, so the ecological history raises these issues about our past practices. We should be ashamed and guilted by it, but you know, as I said, we have a lot of work to do. Dealing with ecological ethics, I think, um, is a way to renew the, the, the relationship between philosophy and technology, something David began the, the seminar with, a kind of now philosophy matters again. Uh, philosophy matters even more now than it has. And technology happens to be something where we can actually say something about We can do something about it. The essays that I gave you hopefully provoke some thinking about these subjects. Um, if we can look at the areas where we're really good, lifestyle analysis, consumption issues, and expand that to think about what's really necessary and link that then to the technologies we need to make those things happen and to come up with some you know, eco-ethical perspective on this, I think we'll be able to contribute to a, a new way of thinking about the creative industries and, a, and really keep in check this kind of idea that there's, you know, uh, um, in this kind of uh, uninhibited growth possible. That it's just going to be a wonderful um, nonstop uh, development of new technologies and, and creative industries. We have to be the ones to keep it in check. There are pragmatic challenges as well on the ground, and I mentioned something called life cycle assessment. Um, it's not coming out of, of critical studies. Life cycle assessment is coming out of, of industrial uh, studies. It's coming from U.S. It's coming from the corporations themselves who are, are keen on, on developing their own kind of green credentials on the one hand, but also looking for ways to cut costs, energy costs and, and other uh, costs in the production of their, of their goods and materials. Companies like Ericsson are very, I mean, if you look at the scale of green companies, Ericsson is doing very well. Other companies like AT&T may claim they're doing very well, but when you look at the, the numbers, it's not so great. Even General Electric, the biggest polluter uh, of the Hudson River, uh, biggest uh, issuer of PCBs uh, on the planet probably, has, is turning green and the efforts have been, I'd say, very difficult for them. It, organizational changes have been very hard for them, but um, they're starting to buy into this idea that they need to find ways to go green. And these are pragmatic, probably insufficient, probably too late, but it's happening at that level. And as I mentioned, even News Corp, uh, Rupert Murdoch, um, for the first time had a meeting, a teleconference meeting, with all employees of, of News Corporation in May 2007 and announced that they were going to be, um, they were going to reduce their carbon footprint to zero by 2010. And he had a um, basically a, a war plan to make it happen throughout the corporation. And uh, according to some of our informants who are working at Fox, it's happening on the ground. It's causing some organizational problems inside, or let's say organizational changes inside. People are having to work differently. The technologies are changing inside. But um, where it is uh, that uh, Rupert was convinced by Al Gore at one of these corporate seminars that he held, plus he was convinced by the diminishing in, uh, environment in, in Australia, I'm, I guess, touched by, by what's happening to, to his homeland. That's what I heard. Um, but it's happening. It's probably too little, too late. Um, and we have a role to play, and this is critical, experimental thinkers, <laughs> what we can do to, to help uh, make these changes come about. That's about 45 minutes, and I can answer more questions. Great, thank you. Um,